good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. That helps me so much. Welcome to our 2023 Whiteside Distinguished Preaching Lecture as part of our Bandy Conference. Thank you for everyone that was in chapel this morning. And uh, I know you'll be present with us tomorrow when we have the festival of preaching and the preaching panel. And then on Thursday morning when Dr. Howard John Wesley will be our preacher in chapel on Thursday morning. It is my honor to introduce someone I've known since AAR um, 2004. Uh, in 2004, it was the first time I'd taken my daughter to AAR, and she was introduced to being a womanist. And Toni Morrison, I believe, was the speaker then. It was my first presentation. No, my first presentation is the first time I met her. Toni Morrison was a little bit later. But I took, took my daughter, and it's my first presentation on a Sunday morning, and she sat with Auntie Cheryl, who made sure Veronica was welcome. Cheryl was on one side. Oh, before that? Oh, I'm sorry. Iowa School of Theology. I forgot I went there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Iowa School of Theology. We met at Iowa School of Theology back in the really days. And yeah. then we were at AAR. Yeah. Was and, that's right, when she was little, and I cooked fried chicken for her at my house. Oh, yeah. So that's how all the business. After that, we were at AAR. Now, let me get back to AAR. Yeah. And for my first that's presentation at AAR, that Sunday morning, and I said, it's Sunday. I didn't know what to do because it was my first presentation. And Emily Town said, you're a preacher. So that's what I did and for my presentation at AAR. And so on one side of Veronica was Cheryl Thompson Jokes, and the other side was Katie Judy Buchanan, and Emily Towns was in front of us. And so she was, she was born into womanism through AAR and women that become sisters, more than professors that become sisters, that people you can trust over the years. Cheryl Thompson Jokes is the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor Emerita of African American Studies and Sociology at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. She's an ordained Baptist minister. She's the assistant pastor for special projects at Union Baptist Church in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She holds degrees in sociology from Northeastern University, where she obtained a BA, an MA, and a PhD, and has pursued graduate theological studies at Boston University School of Theology. Her research, teaching, and writing has specific, me, specifically focused on the role of African American women in generating social change and on the diverse roles of black Christian women in the 20th century. She's currently at work on a book entitled The Blessed Book, The Bible and the African American Cultural Imagination. Her most recent work also focuses on the sociology of W.E.B. Du Bois and on the impact of African Muslims on the formation of African American Christianity through slavery. Some of her essays and articles are gathered in her 2001 book, If It Wasn't for the Women, Black Women's Experience of Womanist Culture in Church and Community. She served as an editor for the 2012 volume Sisters of African Descent, Connecting Spirituality, Religion, and Vocation. Several of her journal articles have been reprinted in anthologies such as the African American Religious Thought in an anthology edited by Cornell West, Eddie Loud, and Kenneth Amon, the, board, the, excuse me, the Border Regions of Faith. Until the pandemic, she was Dr. Dr. Cheryl on Colby College's radio station where she hosted a gospel music radio show, The Uncloudy Day, for 19 years. Since the pandemic, she has contributed several opinion pieces in religious news service and has written the introduction to the 50th anniversary publication of James Cone's book, The Spiritual and the Blues and Interpretation. So it's my honor to introduce my sister, my soror. That means Delta Sigma Theta for all of you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. First of all, let me just say it's good to be here. And given the what they have done to the to our airport in Atlanta, they've turned it into a torture chamber. <laughs> but praise the Lord, we got here. But you know I was tired when we went to Wendy's last night. And I tried to give them my Delta Sigma Theta membership card for a credit card. <laughs> I needed some sleep. <laughs> so good afternoon. First and foremost, I just want to say uh, thank you. Thank you. Greetings and thank you, first of all, 
to Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown, who had enough faith in me to invite me to come and visit you all today. And so I'm happy to be here. And then a thank you to Ayanna Smith, who worked so hard to keep up with somebody who was having trouble keeping up with herself. <laughs> um, so <laughs> but we got here, and we're here. And thank you so much. The hospitality was wonderful. I get there. And it was going on 2 o'clock in the morning when I walked in the hotel, so that'll give you an idea of what I misconnected in Charlotte and then got here. But I will tell you this. If you had walked by my hotel room at quarter to this morning, you would have heard the, the fruit and the cheese crying out in agony as they were being consumed voraciously. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So I, and then I had to attend chapel this morning virtually and I want to, I don't know if Dr. Long is here, but if he's not here, let him know that I said he preached. He preached. Mm -hmm. So, good afternoon. Let me get going because I'm Baptist. I told you I'm Baptist, and I'm right now teaching a seminar that runs three hours, and so um, we must be careful. So, if you see me looking at my watch, I need the discipline. I need the discipline. I love the theme, and as soon as um, I got the theme that context matters. My, it just came over me. Speaking life in difficult places, the ethnographic charge to the preacher. And I assume if you all are at a preaching conference, you want to know something about the charge to the preacher. And if I have misread the room, let me know. <laughs> Afterwards. OK, not right now. <laughs> and so this. You know, learning to read the room. This lecture is going to be a series of personal reflections on ministry in difficult places and a sort of retrospective reflection for me on the gift of ethnographic training. And that will become clear and, as I provide what, um, what we used to say. <laughs> I remember these days we, when we would want to steal something from somebody and sort of cite them without name, we said, as the old preacher would say, a few scattering remarks. When you realize you are the age of those old preachers when you were calling them old preachers, and yet they're, um, what they said still stands. So I'm borrowing from one of, the, one of the people who was an old preacher to me who would say, I have a few scattering remarks. So you're going to get some personal experiential reflections on lessons about context. And then a little bit about the ethnographic charge. And yes, I borrowed the term charge from that old Methodist hymn that African Americans have appropriated into their oral tradition, a charge to keep I have, a God to glorify, never dying soul to save and fit it for the sky. And one tape that I have from a church in Florida where they actually raised the hymn, the old style. Then the deacon who was raising the hymn said, this is my favorite verse. This is why I'm here, to serve this present age. My calling to fulfill, oh may it all my powers engage to do my Savior's will. So, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about our ethnographic charge as preachers and then to our charge to do a little bit of reading of Jesus' room and um, in, in the work that we do. And yes, the basic point, context matters. Let me tell you a story. This comes from, I, I answered my call to ministry in 82. But I started teaching and I was telling um, Reverend Dr. Fry, uh, Fry Brown um, that I actually started teaching about race and ethnicity when I was in graduate school. I was in a program that, it was a new PhD program at a working class school. Why did I stay there? They kept giving me money. Um, and so the chair of the department wanted us to get a lot of teaching experience under our belt before we were graduated with our PhDs. 
And so the chair, who I was a little bit terrified of, I, I went to graduate school in the days when <laughs> chairs worked at terrifying students and students worked at be, being appropriately terrified. Um, <laughs> They don't do that anymore. <laughs> Students have rights now. Oh my God. So he, <laughs> he and, and he he was he was special because he looks like a woodcut in a book that I had that uh, that pictured Jeremiah standing by the broken walls of Jerusalem. So so whenever I saw him in the hallway, I thought about Je Jeremiah by the walls of Jerusalem, and I listened to what he had to say. That's how he got old. He didn't know that. I never told him that. He walked up to me in the hall. Do you have a driver's license? No, Dr. Stone, I don't have a driver's license. Go get one. So I went out. I, I, I had kept my learner's permit in force from the time when I had spectacularly, spectacularly flunked my driving test in front of the entire junior class. I did it so spectacularly, all the boys lay down on the sidewalk and laughed. That's how bad it was. That's all I'm going to say. But I had kept my learner's permit in force, so I had read every iteration of Bruce rules of the road in Massachusetts. If you've ever driven in Massachusetts and know how chaotic it is, I can tell you why and, and give you some idea of the context. So I got my driver's license and I walked into his office and I got my driver's license and said, good, next year you're going to be teaching at the Burlington campus of the university and we wanted to make sure you could get there. And I started teaching about race and ethnicity in 1973. And he worked hard to get me teaching gigs so I could have experience teaching. And one of them ended up being, I had, on Mondays, I had a classroom full of police officers. And you have to understand, in 73, I looked like Angela Davis's short, fat, evil twin. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Jeans, and there were 40 white male police officers, four civilians, one of whom was black, and one female police officer who sat with the civilians, and the, the, the four civilians and the one woman sat in the back of the room to watch and said, okay, what's going to happen here? And me and... 40 dudes. I never knew how many ways folks could carry a gun. I mean, mm, I mean, fat, I mean, ankle, I mean. And then um, there were some, there was one guy who was so big that other officers wondered if he had the handles of his gun specially made. I mean, this was the class. And so they, I had them on Monday. On Thursday, I drove to Walpole Prison, which was a maximum security prison in Massachusetts. And there were days, if I shut my eyes, I wasn't sure which classroom I was in. Wow. And one of the civilians later told me about halfway through the class, every so often I would say something or I'd make them read something that sort of penetrated their wall, their blue wall, and they didn't like it, um, this outsider invading their space, and so they would riot in class. And I've always had a philosophy, starting from my first day of teaching at the suburban campus out wherever, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And when you say that, you gotta answer the questions. And so, so I, you know, I, 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 they would riot and I would patiently listen and I found out later, you're lucky, they like you. What do they do to people they don't like? These are the police officers I'm talking about now. And then she told me what they did because the faculty, the other faculty, didn't like them because they were police officers. They were being sent to college. This was back in the late 60s, early 70s when all those riots that were caused by police misbehavior, sound familiar, the, the legal um, law enforcement assistance administration grant we're sending police officers to college, figuring if they take a sociology course and a psychology course, maybe they won't be so quick to use their batons. And at the end of the year, I said, they're taking the sociology and the psychology, and they'll stand over you and say, we know that you have psychological problems. And then they will beat your ass. You know, it was like, and 
And it was interesting to have the police officers talk to one another, because I had suburban officers, I had urban officers, and if I had committed a class A felony in the front of the room, I would not have been arrested, because I had police officers who, who were out of their sectors, and they did not want to have to explain why they were not where they were supposed to be at the time they were in my classroom. So, and the others didn't have any jurisdiction. So, you know, you know, this was my life. So, but on Thursdays, I had the folks in Walter. And there's standard lectures that you give when you teach introductory sociology. I should say there are standard lectures that I used to give. And so, I've got my rioters on Monday. And I've got my men on Thursdays. And I've gone through security and all this stuff. And I'm teaching about Durkheim. Now, if anybody's ever taken an, a, a, an introductory sociology class, Emmy, when you teach Emil Durkheim, you talk about social facts. And you use his classic volume, Suicide. So I was lecturing. And remember, I'm new at this. This is the first couple of years. So I'm you know, writing out lectures that sometimes I'm almost falling asleep on myself. And, I, you know, I, and, I, and so one of the students in the class that day dissociated. And it just so happened that I was really into a man by the name of R.D. Lang, so much so that I named my first car blonde, the psychiatrist R.D. Lang. So my aim, you know, Angela Davis's short, fat, evil twin, was to understand where he was coming from. So I listened and I responded and I finally was able to find out what little item on the wall of the classroom had triggered him. And we, we, did, we didn't use the word triggered then. This is, this is a new vocabulary word I have learned. But, you know, and so we got him back. So at the end of class, some of the students came to me and they said, you really handled that well because the other option when he was dissociating was to call for help. And the way in which the classroom was, or the room was organized, the class rooms themselves were part of one big cell with a guard outside the one big room. And if I had called anybody in, that would have been the end of class. That would have caused, I mean, just an administrative nightmare. I did not know all of this at the time. I just knew that I was into R.D. Lang and I was going to listen to this man and find out where he was coming from. So they came to me and they said, we understand they had done the reading. The thing about the teaching in prison is they're always two or three weeks ahead in the reading because they don't have anything else to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when they asked me, how come we got to be the lump and proletariat, and my only response was, that's not for two weeks. We'll talk about it then. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And they came up to me and they said, you need to understand something. Every single one of us in this room, and I had about 40 students in that room. I had 40 on Monday and 40 on Thursday. Every one of us in this room has considered, con considered suicide. And I'm lucky. Every one of us. Some of them, even though they had been sentenced, and remember, this is a maximum security prison. So they, yeah, I didn't, even, I only knew what one of them had done, only because, and this, this is weird, this is strange, only because his girlfriend was the lady police officer that was sitting in the back of my other classroom on Monday, and yeah, on Monday with other group, and then she came to explain to me how it was that he had ended up in prison and didn't have appropriate um, attorney, right? Okay. That, you know, the charge should have been this, but it was this, and now he's there. And I'm like, wow. And at the time, I wasn't saying, Lord, because I was, this was during my wanderings away from the church. And I'm like, I wasn't looking up to heaven and going, Lord, what's going on here? I'm like, whoa, is Mercury in retrograde? You know, <laughs> kind of, kind of. <laughs> but you know, there's that old song, Our Soul Looks Back and Wonders, How I Got Old. Yeah. That was my big lesson in reading the room. That what I considered a standard lecture 
because for generations of intro sociology, that was the standard, the gold standard, to be able to make sense of Durkheim's social facts by explaining why so suicide needed to be looked at sociologically and not as a personally painful, was something that could trigger this man who was psychotic, and a couple weeks later I got there and he wasn't in class, and I said, what happened to so-and-so? And they said, oh dear, he's gone off, they had sent him off to the place for the criminally insane because, and this is how prisons work. That Sunday night, the menu was pea soup. And all of his friends who had been defending him and helping him cope with the institution. This is what prisoners do for one another. We hear about the bad side of prison. We don't hear about how they learn to help one another. And his buddies who were trying to um, help him stay straight when he started to dissociate, when they didn't want pea soup. And he was the only one of the group that went to dinner that night. And when he climbed up on the table and began preaching, they carted him off to the place where he ended up. So that was the first one of my students I lost that day. But all of that is to say, and the only reason I'm telling you this story is that was my dramatic introduction to context matters. You've got to read the room. And all of a sudden, I saw, as I thought about this conference, I said, I thought about my own circumstances. A black woman college professor who answered her call to ministry late in life. I was already, um, I, I was already a, a, an assistant professor. I was on a tenure track at Boston University, and I answered this call to ministry. I was, and obviously I'd gotten back into church, I answered, hold, won't go through a long story. But I had struggled with the question of why in the world would God use a sociologist? Because, you know, we're very secular. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and I had, when, when I started um, studying African American women and social change, I was interested in, even when I was lo looking at the sanctified church, I was more interested in issues of social change. Why at a certain point in the history of African Americans that all of a sudden they start building new churches. And I wanted to extend William Julius Wilson's understanding and power race into the privilege about the ways in which social change changed the ways in which we approach issues of race and ethnicity. God had other ideas, and here we are. But I was wondering, should I leave academia or, and just do parish ministry? There were so many questions and so many prayerful struggles. One of the things that happened was I, was, I would find myself reading through, I, I had a pastor who constantly utilized the minor prophets who were preaching. So at, on Sunday afternoon, I would come home and I would look at the text now you know you got the itch when you got to come home and reread the text that the pastor had <laughs> preached. In. And then, okay, well, what what else was there? Well, let's read the whole book. Oh my goodness, they're talking about inequality and injustice and the poor. Oh my goodness, wow! This is before sociology was invented, <laughs> you know. And it was this process of discovery that made the scriptures matter to me. But the ways in which the scripture mattered to me was where I already was as this sociologist who had been trained, not all, my, the area of sociology I chose was the area that emphasizes ethnography. I didn't tell you I was also in a joint anthropology and sociology program. Had they had a PhD in anthropology, Marla, I would be an anthropologist <laughs> rather than a sociologist. Okay, so, so 40 years later, my soul is looking back and wondering. And my soul is looking back in wonder. So, um, and, and, and I want to share a little bit about our ethnographic charge as preachers. Um, and I, my own discovery of how the gift of ethnography helped me in my work, okay, and, 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 and what, why this is important. Why, if, if you haven't had a chance to learn how to do ethnography and qualitative anal analysis, try to do it. I was fortunate enough to be in this program where, remember that terrifying chair who looked like Jeremiah by the walls of Jerusalem? 
he was cynical enough to know that. The, and remember, this is back in the 70s. You know, I've been doing this for 50 years. Okay. <laughs> Scary. But he realized that academia was still discriminating against women. So that he could, in building his program, get the best women because other places weren't taking them in. So some of the best sociologists who were women and anthropologists who were women came through our department, one of whom was a woman by the name of Mary Catherine Bateson. I recommend her books. Uh, but her mother, when, every time her mother wanted to see her granddaughter, she'd get herself invited to give a colloquium at our little working class program. Her mother's name was Margaret Meek. And Margaret Mead would show up, sit down and give a colloquium, get her transportation paid, and then um, go cuddle her grandchild after we got through. And she would sip sherry while she was giving a colloquium. So we'd watch her get loose and then really say some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> like the time she tried, we had a bunch of Native Americans in the room and tried to tell them that they wouldn't have any culture if, if it wasn't for the anthropologists. And I, I sort of cringed. And, I wonder, what are these brothers from AIM? Because they were from a security force from a takeover. Uh, some of them were staying with me. That's how I know. And I was like, what are these brothers going to do? They're like, we respect the elders. Their value of respecting the elders overrode their temptation to cuss her out. <laughs> it, was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. <laughs> but the one thing that she said that hit me hard was, when we go into the field, we try to be a 360 degree camera. Mm -hmm. It means being patient and willing to sit and look and listen and shut up and learn. Yeah. When my one of the people who was staying with me, a woman, began to engage in certain practices, I wanted to just jump up and say, why are you, you know, and I remember I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you've been telling people that they must shut up and listen and learn. You need to shut up and listen and learn. And I shut up and I listen and I learn. And I learn. And I learn. And I shut up and listen and learn so much that the AIM people invited me to testify for them before the legislature. So, you know, you, you, you get built and then you can be an ally. You, there's all so much you can do. But I also have discovered that I was hardwired to be an ethnographer. I grew up, I was an only child for eight years. And so my mother just took me with her everywhere. And I learned, you know, you hang out with adults. If they start to spell in front of you, <laughs> don't, when you sound the word out in your head, don't shout the word out. Because if you don't do that, you get to stay in the room where it happens, in the room where it happens. If you want to be in the room where it happens, shut up and don't shout out the word. I one time made a whole congregation of adults glower at me when I looked at the children and told them, don't shout out the words when you, you know, sound it out in your head and you get to stay in the room. And you can see the parents going, and all these little children going, they listen hard when you preach, trust me. I had a I uh, had a squad of four-year-olds almost knock me over after a seven and a half word service one night because they liked something that I said and a little friend brought them. These little people, when they're in a group, they have a lot of power. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're only this high, but you know, I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not going to be over. But it felt good. But what you have to do is sit and learn and listen and then engage in thick descriptions. So I used to sit in the corner of the choir room and listen to gospel singers talk about how dead my church was. And I didn't realize at the time I was learning about issues of class and status and all of this other stuff that was going on. But just being able to have a thick understanding of who people are, where they're coming from, trying to figure out just my own church. Now, I don't use my own church to write about, uh, that's not quite true, but um, for the most part, it's not one of my research centers. But just trying to figure out why are certain people in charge? How do they get to be in charge? Who are they? And then discovering that families matter. I can remember as a little child, I did, again, my poor parents, I, 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 I was blessed to be raised by parents. When I asked questions, they answered them. They didn't go just shh, shh, shh. 
And remember, I was an only child for eight years, and my father was in the military, so my mother only had me to talk to anyway. So I got a lot of investment, got a lot of investment. And I went to a Baptist church where the deacon, in the old days, they would sit facing the congregation. And then when the pastor got up to preach, they'd get up out of their chairs and turn around and sit on the very front row. If you're ever in a black church and wonder why the very front row is vacant, that's probably a, um, a legacy from when most deacons would get up, turn around, and sit. And then that front row would later on become the mourner's bench, et cetera, et cetera. So, so they would get up, and then one of the, our deacons, now this is the 1950s in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, my church is the 1878 church started by folks who were both from the area as well as from North Carolina. Vance County, Henderson, North Carolina. I have never been in Vance County, Henderson, North Carolina. He was kind of be honest, soon. Yes, I am. But I've been to festivals. One time a musicologist asked me if I was from North Carolina, and I said no, but the people who founded my church were from North Carolina. So that cultural investment. So, so, so that one of the deacons was white. And so I finally noticed that he was white. And it wasn't that he was a different color, because there was some black people in the church, you know, the diversity of black folks, you know. But by that age, I had figured out who was black and who was white, even though they were all different colors. Um, and I go, why is that white man sitting up front? My mother, hush, don't you mention that that's white man. <laughs> I had to wait until I was on my way to ordination and visiting him in the hospital to discover which family, the theory about family networks and that leadership came from, because his wife never sat with him and I didn't realize to whom he was married, but as soon as I saw them together in the hospital room, the whole family network made sense and he was the representative for that family. So, so that, that, that need to be an ethnographer in your own space, to understand what's really going on and not get caught up in the tendency because sitting and listening to preachers talk about their churches is like, don't you know these people? You know, that, that you know, all of a sudden, the folks that get on your last nerve don't get so much on your last nerve when you know who they are, where they're coming from, and how to talk to them. We have one lady in them. I've got to find her. I've saved this letter, and I hope I have it in my papers. Um, she, she was eccentric as all get out. And she had been eccentric for a long time. My mother was angry with her for interrupting a preacher during a women's day, and my mother stayed angry with her for the rest of her life. Every time you mention this lady's name, she would talk about what this woman did that Sunday. And so I, I knew she was a little eccentric. Uh, occasionally, we would have to go to the extent of getting, calling, going downstairs on the payphone, having a phone call come to the pastor's office to say we have a call for a guest preacher to get her away from the guest preacher without being too cruel. So when I say, she was eccentric, she was eccentric. But she also sent me a letter one time about her life. And all of a sudden, everything made sense. Everything made sense. And that Arden Lang in me says, listen to them. That anthropologist in me says, listen to them and be that 360 degree camera. And if you can do it for your own folks, you can do it wherever you go. I'm in the process. And the other thing about ethnography is it requires thick description. And if we as preachers want to tell the story, we need thick description to do it. We need thick description to do it. I'm in the process of rediscovering Zora Neale Hurston. I'm teaching a course we're using Moses Man of the Mountain. And I'm really appreciating her as an anthropologist at a whole mother level. Can't recommend her enough yet. And understand that we would not have her as prominently as we have her if it wasn't for her rediscovery by way of Alice Walker. 
who said, I love her because I hear the people I grew up with. I'm paraphrasing. But that's what made Alice Walker bring her back, put a stone on her grave, and bring her writings back to prominence. And I find myself in the process realizing that gathering, just gathering my Zora Neale first and stuff, I've got two full shopping bags sitting next to my, my, my chair as I'm teaching this course where we're using Moses' Man of the Mountain. What we need to do when we're talking about the ethnographic charge is we have to engage as ministers, as preachers, in cultural translation and in interpretation. We have to be able to make what in, 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 in Paul called a certain sound, a title, a, a, a phrase that Samuel DeWitt Proctor used as a title for his book of sermons. That when we're talking about speaking in tongues, we're not just talking about glossolalia and whether or not there's an interpreter present, but it's also about cultural translation and interpretation. We've got to beware of narrow emphases and that limit our ability to read the room. Next time you go back and look at Acts 2, realize that the tongues that are going on in that upper room, if you're just reading the upper room, there are multiple cultures, tongues, nations, tongues, and kindred. And they are talking about being able to hear the gospel in their own languages. And then it helps. You have to sort of get in depth and understand, you know, why are all these people gathered here in the Feast of the Tabernacles? You've got to explain to people that, you know, folks just didn't hop on the plane, run through Atlanta Airport to go to Passover in Jerusalem and then come back home. They saved their money for years and years and years. They have to get on a boat. They're not going to go hop on the boat as soon as Passover is over. They're going to, hey, I might as well hang out in Jerusalem a little while. There's another festival coming. There's another opportunity. To, to celebrate and do things and see people and meet people. But folks were coming from all around the known world, which was the Mediterranean world. Just making sense of that puts a whole new light on what we mean when we're talking about speaking in tongues and having an interpreter present. Now, I told you I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I uh, grew up with um, a mother and a grandmother. My grandmother was from Savannah, and I, uh, I have referred to them in my writings as linguistic terrorists. Um, <laughs> what do I mean by a linguistic terrorist? When your mother is so determined that you not say ain't I or aren't I, you find yourself on the playground saying to your friends, am I not it? <laughs> And then one of those friends, when she's introducing you to be the Women's Day preacher at the church, said, well, we were little kids. We thought she was weird, but now we understand. <laughs> but my grandma was from Savannah. And anybody knows anybody from Savannah? You're talking about the Gullah Geechee Corridor. And my people, she was born in 1883. And people used to have to ask her, Miss So-and-so, are you from the South? And she would answer, yes, and I intend to stay from the South. <laughs> but every so often, she would get going and she'd start talking. And I remember running through her house, because, you know, when you're a little kid, black, you get sent to the grandparents in the summertime, right? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> and I remember running behind her going, Nanny, Nanny, what do you say? What do you say? I had no idea what she was saying. It took Daughters of the Dust to help me to understand that she was speaking God. Okay. But I grew up with those, with, with those linguistic terrorists. But, it, but so... Getting to know what these tongues are and understand where they come from. The tongues indicate nations and kindred. And it's not, not just multilingual, but we're talking about a multicultural event. Who are all these cultures? What are the experiences of God's people in these strange lands where they may or may not speak Hebrew, and then when you get into Acts, and you know, Paul has this point where he, you know, he jumps up, you know, and, and, and starts shouting in Hebrew so only the Pharisees can understand him while the Romans, you know, all of a sudden, as the anthropological imagination makes that live in a way that helps you to make it live 
for those who need to know about the gospel. So, and then I am, you know, so here I am as a black woman going through this ethnography thing, bringing these gifts after I struggle with prayer. Do I need to stay in academia? And the, and the Lord said, yes, and I'm glad I did. But I'm a non-pastor. When you're, when you're trying to do the uh, academic and the ministry, so pastoring full-time is not always an option. Mm -hmm. okay? But as my father, the deacon, said to me, you run out there and say you have a call, you have to be ready for, to, to, for people to respond to you and be ready and be prepared to serve regardless of where you are. So you have to ask questions. Um, earlier, I asked, I can check this time, uh, I asked Dr. Fry Brown, I said, how long do you want me to speak? I don't go anywhere without asking that question. When I was training for the ministry, now here I am, a tenure track professor, sitting on doctoral committees at the seminary where I'm taking courses because if you're a full time employee, you get six free credits per semester. You know, I wasn't going to turn that down. That was, that's another point. But, um, you know, here, here, here I am trying to do this and going, and, and I'm also interning, following the pastor, going wherever, wherever. And so I go to preach a women's day, and I get to the church of the man who is the president of the association where eventually I will have to go to the ordination council and get ordained. And he greets me at the door and he goes, daughter, if you sit down before 45 minutes, you haven't done your job. And so you can tell the cultural milieu, the preaching, the preaching culture in which I was immersed. We were used to sit in a while. Okay. And so a friend of mine recommended me as a preacher for a jubilee service at a place called Dartmouth College. You've heard of it. And they called and said, we're having an African-American jubilee service, and we want you to come and preach an African-American sermon. <laughs> and I was busy learning, you know, about, you know, because when you're learning how to preach, you're also learning from those whose preaching you like, who are considered effective preachers. And there was this text that just lent itself to one particular preacher. I won't name him, but he was one of those folks. And he was one of those folks who at the time, he was like about 78 years old when I was in seminary. Uh, he's long gone, but he was one of those preachers. <laughs> he took his time reading the scripture. And when he got through, it was Noted expository preacher, and, it, and the marketing text for when Jesus turns out the temple lent itself to this, right? Because Jesus gets in there, he stops what's going on, then he turns the place out, and then he teaches. So you know that. So I, so I took my time, came in. I, I came in just about fifty minutes, and my friend, who happened to be black, but who was also Lutheran. Lord, that me. <laughs> oh, I was really thinking about a 12-minute homily. I was like, oh my God. So that's when I learned about the multiplicity of spaces. How long should I preach? Girl, if you go there past 20 minutes, I, I lose. Them. So I stick. You know, so at different places I go. A year later, she calls me. And she wants me to come back. And I said, after that long donkey sermon, translated to King James, after that long donkey sermon I preached last year, you want me to come back? She said, the students gave me a list, and your name was at the top of the list, but can you please come in at 20 minutes? I said, OK. And I went every year until she retired. Well, honey, I'm in Princeton Seminary in the refectory one day for another conference. We love these conferences. This is what happens if you, you're a preacher in an academic. You get to go to conferences a lot. And this young man sits down and goes, hi. And I said, hi. He said, you don't remember me. I said, 
Where he from? He says, I'm from Dartmouth College. He proceeded to preach the whole sermon back to me as he had answered his call to the ministry. And I didn't even remember all my points. And he was remembering my points. So I dragged that sermon out of walk balls. Yes, I did. And went and preached it at my own church. And so, <laughs> but, but wait, there's a, there's a cultural interpretation of peace there. Because remember, it's an African-American sermon. So I put the ironics on it, you know. Sometimes the title of the sermon is "Sometimes You Got to Act Ugly." <laughs> so I preached this sermon and I put the ironic on it, and I didn't realize that one of my colleagues, who was also a sociologist, who was also a member of the church, I had seen him get up and move across the church, and he sat down behind one of our members who happened to be white, and I didn't know why he did that. <laughs> Until I read her essay in The Atlantic, where she talked about how he had come and culturally translated the black English because he wasn't sure that she would understand what I was talking about. So the issue of cultural translation, I have lived it. And just simply asking what the room expects and how long they're able to sit can teach you an awful lot. So I can do it. Eight minutes, I can do two hours. You know, just tell me how long the, the train gets to go. <laughs> the other thing about being a black woman preacher, and this, 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 this is something, I, women's days turned out to be one of the greatest training grounds. Yes, it was tokenism. Yes, it was a way of avoiding um, not discriminating against us. And yes, it was a way that women used to resist being excluded. First time I preached a Women's Day down in New Jersey, I get there and there were women there from other churches. Here I was at a Baptist church. The woman who had come from the women's the women's group over at the AME church, their organization was called the Nanny Helen Burroughs Society. So you could see the interaction of the interdenominational interaction that defines the black church with all of these women sitting in the pulpit. And after it was over, the pastor who was sitting in the congregation gets up to have remarks. And he said, I thank God for this. He said, this Women's Day usually raises one third of the church's annual budget. The sociologist in me was going crazy. I, yes, I sat calmly on the pulpit, but inside I'm like, I can't wait to go back and write about this, explore this some more, and look at the role of women in raising all of this money and how people. <laughs> Women's Days. What's so special about Women's Days? Yes, it's discrimination. Yes, it's, it has to do with this history of discrimination. Yes, it has to do with tokenism. But yes, it has to do with whole groups of women in congregations who sit down and reason together about what themes they want, what scripture they want to emphasize, and as things have grown, what workshops they want conducted. I mean, this is amazing. They also will pick out colors. And you know, most you know, everybody would complain about wearing white suits, et cetera. And one time I got a call from the church to come and preach to them and say, and they didn't tell me anything about the colors. So I called the chair back, because by now I've been fully trained by a lot of congregations. I said, did you pick a color? She said, yes. The women didn't want to wear white this year. We're going to be wearing blue. So then I thought about it. I called her up again. Is there a theological? No, I, first, I called her back and said, what shade? <laughs> said, after the women voted, there's a big data. After the women voted, when she was standing by the door greeting them as they left, everybody was walking by. What shade. <laughs> shade. And then I finally said to her, was there a theological reason that you picked blue? She goes, no, but you can find <laughs> if the color is blue, free from Esther. Okay. So this, we have an ethnographic 
traffic charge. Take the time to learn how to sit and gather, gather data, gather qualitative data. Learn how to sit and listen and be quiet and understand that with every human behavior, we may not like the behavior, but somewhere underneath that, there's something human going on that we need to know. And we need to be able to speak back to folks in ways that they can hear us. And then I want to close by just reminding us, we have an ethnographic charge to read Jesus' room. We, we have an ethnographic charge to read Jesus' room. What did they say about Jesus? He was the great, greatest prophet since Moses. And we thought he was going to re, you know, reestablish the kingdom. And we focus on his Davidic, we, we focus on his Davidic heritage, and um, we we and and yet we we don't quite focus on his priestly heritage. Hello. His mama was probably most likely a Levite. How do we know that she might have been a Levite? Because she's the cousin of Elizabeth. Levite women can marry anybody they want, but Levite men can only marry Levites. And all of a sudden, you've got Jesus walking around in the house of David with priestly genes, but reminding us all that he is a great prophet. And he is somebody who's, and, and this is what really matters, that prophetic context really matters. The prophetic context of Jesus' ministry, that ministry that he brings for those who have their backs against the wall, as Howard Thurman would say. When we were reading Howard Thurman for my course, and we start talking about backs against the wall, I start asking the students, well, how did Jesus talk about people with their backs against the wall? And if we don't read, if we don't follow the ethnographic charge to read Jesus' room, Judea and Samaria, and the ways in which he moved around and among people who over the, over the centuries by tradition have been excluded from the central places, you don't understand how he spoke to people with their backs against the wall. One, one, of, the, one of my favorite ways of making sense of Jesus is all of his travels back and forth to Samaria, from Judea and Galilee into Samaria. Because, you know, and the, and the woman at the well, that said, no, you know, you all don't talk to us. Um, and one of the greatest sermons that Jeremiah right and preaches is about this um, this encounter between Jesus and the woman at the well. But you find Jesus moving in Samaria and moving on the borderlands and frontiers. We so we spend so much time trying to interpret Jesus's um, encounter with the Syrophoenician woman as you know was Jesus prejudiced, is this is racist, what do we call it? And miss the fact that he's in the borderlands hmm. of an area that was exercising power over Judea, and yet here she comes asking him for help when he's in Samaria. I wonder if that nice Luke text where, you know, here's Jesus and, and the ten lepers come, and they, the, Jesus says, go show yourselves to the priest, and they take off, and the only one who comes back is the Samaritan. You know, he went to know if there's something special in his psychology. He couldn't go to Judea. But the Judeans, when they're about to get cleansed, they're like, where's Jesus? Well, he's up in Samaria. We got to go up into Samaria? Tell you a story. I teach, I, I'm a marathon now at a predominantly white institution. And my students who take my course uh, would tell me some of the experiences. And some of them were in Boston, they got lost. And they ended up in the black community in Roxbury, and they didn't know where they were. So they stopped and they got out. And they went to ask one of the brothers on the corner for directions to get out. And the brother on the corner said, we'll give you directions. You give us $10. And I said to the student, what did you do? He said, we gave him $10. <laughs> Just realized, those nine Judeans, in order to find Jesus, needed somebody who knew Samaria. Think about it. 
does it give you a whole new ethnographic view of Jesus' room? Yeah, the one who came back to Jesus to say thank you is telling us something about Jesus, the priest. Not just the king, but also the prophet who's with the folks against their back against the wall. God speaks by way of the human imagination. And the context of a particular human imagination matters. We who are Christians, preaching must fully engage the context of the human being to whom we preach. And we must fully engage the context of the human being whom we preach. We preach Jesus. We must read our rooms with the eyes and ears of Jesus and be prepared to speak life in difficult places, in all kinds of places, with police officers rioting in front of us, with black women seeking a way to have leadership with all of the people, strangers and, and, and otherwise, whose pe people whose backs are against the wall. A charge to keep we have, a God to glorify to serve this present age in all of its difficult places. Our calling, we must speak life in difficult places. Thank you very much. I went over time. We've given out cards for those of you who wanted to write a question. We have any cards on this side if you'll pass them down. Remember, there's no such thing as a stupid question. All right, while waiting for the cards, does anyone want to stand up and ask a question? Uh, Dr. Frederick's class happens to be passed to me. Go back to the room. Thank you for coming. There'll be a pop quiz tomorrow. Fifth floor. Remember who Catherine Bates' mother is. She taught a linguistics course at the school. And people who do linguistics, they, they, they have another whole set of matter in the brain that some of us do not have. And we had 30 people in that class, and the end of the class was a 29 incompletes of 1A. I got one of the incompletes. First, since I see no questions, first let's thank Dr. Kachuk for her lecture. <laughs> we wasted all those little cars. <laughs> they may have used them to take notes. Church here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh -huh. um, so, being Methodist, we are itinerant, which means we could be sent in anywhere, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, as an African American woman, I can be sent to a predominantly white church. Yeah. And so, the question I have for you is, how do you pose? And you gave a lot of great information. So, preaching to the context and staying um, true to who you are. Yeah. In your culture, your ethnicity, etc. What are some tips you have for that? Sometimes it just takes some translation. It, it does, um, because I, well, I've spent what, since 1987, I've been at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. And it's a PWI. And I taught this course called African American Culture in the United States. Now, you know, there's something wrong with trying to do all of that in one semester. <laughs> but I always had to assume, for a lot of the students, it was their first, I found out this was true, their first encounter with the African American experience. Gone to some of the best and most expensive private schools in the nation, or came from some of the most expensive, um, highly prized public school system in the nation. And I get a little note in the final exam about this is my only, my first encounter. Why didn't I know this stuff with all this money my parents spent? Why didn't 
know this stuff. So, and I would have classes where I'd have one or two or a few students. And I was using Toni Morrison's The Black Book, which um, is fun, but there's a lot of headings that come from spirituals. So I, I, I would ask a question about, because you know, the spirituals, one of the things that people don't realize and, until you realize it, is that just about every single spiritual has a biblical anchor. The, 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 the folk, folks, that, one of those, those old signs that had a finger point someplace, that's what they're doing in those, those spirituals. So I, would, I, I was trying to, um, the verse that goes, if I had this, one of the headings was, if I had my way, I'd tear this building down. Mm -hmm. And so I was just lecturing, and I re recited the um, verse. Samson was a strong man, a mighty man was he. Till Delilah knew the secret, would not let him be. She shaved off his head just as clean as your hand, and strength became as any other man. But God let him have his way. He tore that building down. So I you know, said to the student, well, where's Samson? Who's Samson? And so immediately the black student's hands go up, and he said, he's in the Bible. Well, this would happen several times along the way. And then finally, the white students were starting to get why. They look around and see if the black students' hands went up. They would say, it's in the Bible. <laughs> so one day when I was feeling mean and impressive, like Zora Neale Hurston, I said to the class, it was a nice sunny day, had windows on two side, three sides of the room. And I said to the students, I said, what would you have done? If you had had Bible questions on the SAT, all the color drained out of their faces. I almost needed sunglasses to look at the room. <laughs> and one student raised his hand and said, we would have had a demonstration. Trying to understand what you have to share becomes important. They actually, at one point, I had one group of students who insisted that I do a workshop. Even though they had been lit, they just wanted to know what the Bible was. And so trying to do non-sectarian uh, approach to understanding, I, I actually do a workshop. You know, Remember that book that came out, Everything You Wanted to Know About Sex and Was Afraid to Ask? Mm -hmm. Well, with adult beginners, it's everything you want to know about the Bible, but we're afraid to ask. Mm -hmm. Knowing that people can ask questions and then hearing it, but then also explaining to them who I am in certain ways. And so that, uh, one, uh, at one point, trying just to explain religion and the multiplicities and you know you sometimes you just have to talk to what folks know if you've got a congregation where everybody likes to make casseroles you may you may need that as a model for sermons um you got quilters in the group you know it depends on who you know um is it do you have families that were part of the history of the church um there's, there's just so many ways to talk to a predominantly white audience. And I'm thinking, I, I do do preaching. Now, this is interesting. Because I don't pastor, I preach in a lot of different places. Unitarians. Back, here I am, Baptist, Savannah grandmother. You know, for those of us, when you say Savannah, we're you know, first African Baptist church. You know, okay, uh -oh. And so you get invited to a uh, Unitarian church. And I remember one time I got invited to a Unitarian church, and the pastor was so afraid I would say so much about Jesus. And he's like, you, 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 you don't understand the Unitarian And I'm like, okay. Now, I am a black preacher. I need the Bible. But how do I get it in here in a way that will bypass him? The trouble was, he had let the congregation put the service together. They had more Jesus in the music than I ever would have had in my sermon. I was like, I looked at him, and then I looked at that. But I, I, I was using Toni Morrison as my text, because she, in Beloved, in Beloved, she uses biblical, you know, she has you with Hosea, so you can, you know, you can work with that. You know, you know and, and the Unitarian pastors were more afraid of Jesus than the congregation. And one Unitarian church in Maine, you know, I, I, I preached for them, and this elderly white Mainer got on so good to hear a real biblical sermon. Okay. So our gifts, that's the other thing. 
We have gifts we need to share. We have gifts we need to share. The only reason I got on the radio was that I, I played so much music in class because I, I told the students that they didn't know anything else when they left that class, they didn't want to know what a spiritual was. Okay. And I, I said, I'm going to use a definition of culture that your parents use when they drag you to the symphony. You're going to be exposed to something. <laughs> so I, but I, and, and one time, I went, to, I went to move through the history of black music, and I started to play something because I wanted to be relevant. I started to play some hip hop. This, this is a white classroom. They go, no, nah, we don't need to hear that. We hear that all the time. Go back to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, th th this was the kind of thing that happened, but I couldn't play enough. So when they sent out an email and asked the professors if they would um, think about having a radio show, I, I said, oh, I can give a couple of lectures on the air and play some music, play some more music. No, professor, this is not how it works. You must choose a two-hour time slot for an entire semester. Two-hour time slot, that's a, that, that's a seminar. I'm like, I can't do this. And if it wasn't for one of my, my assistant who was African-American, she goes, Professor Jones, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And I'm like, when am I supposed to have this show? It has to be on Wednesday. Why does it have to be on Wednesday? Because that's the only day you're always here. <laughs> they know, they didn't know your business. They know your business. So, you know, on one hand, you know, grasp what's, you know, and you may have to go places with folks. Where's their favorite restaurant? You know, something like that. You know, food, you notice that Jesus was big on food. Hello? Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, one of the things that we do in preparation for qualitative research, because you don't want to go into the field with this, qualitative sociological research, you don't want to go into the field with preconceived theories and notions, is sometimes read novels about the setting mm -hmm. in which you find yourself. Mm -hmm. And there is this no new novel out. Sue Monk Kidd has written this novel called The Book of Longing, and I highly recommend it because she reads the room of Jesus. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you and tell you any of the plot. The Book of Longings, Sue Monk Kidd. If anybody has seen the uh, movie, um, The Secret Life of Bees, yeah. she's the novelist who wrote The Secret Life of Bees. She's also written another one that I've used in another class called um, The Invention of Wings, okay? Highly recommended, highly recommended. And the thing was, you know, I sometimes forget that I'm not white when I'm in Maine. And so, <laughs> And so I, you know, I just I happened to be, uh, I, I, I happened to be in a car. I was being driven um, by the repair shop. Um, I was being driven back to the office, and I was telling her what I was teaching. And I said, "Now I'm using this book, and it's a really great novel, you know, about slavery written by a white person." I'm like, "Wait a minute. Remember where you are." But didn't they get seven years later? I'm getting an email. Can you tell me that novel again? Be yourself. As my ex-husband used to say, be yourself before you be by yourself. <laughs> Obviously, if I married him, he had something to say. <laughs> okay. Hello. Greetings. Greetings. Good afternoon. Thank you so much. You're welcome so much. <laughs> My name is Tiffany Mackey. I graduated here last year, um, and I study and operate at the intersection of policy, the academy, and ministry. Wow. Uh, thoughts and prayers are welcome. Yeah. Um, so, with there not necessarily being a standard, what would what advice would you give when you are trying to discern whether to deconstruct, dismantle, or just start from where you are? It depends on. Um Take some time to do the field work. You, you um, find out one of the things about um, doing qualitative work, besides thick description, is learning the language of the situation. And sometimes that takes a minute. That takes a minute. And learning who in the network is necessary because it's um, it, it's like. When I went to Colby, I left from Boston University 
and I was at a university. Um, if any of you want to know some of the drama that um, some of us experienced, it, I was there from 1978 to 1987. You can actually Google Boston University plus John Silver, who was the president at that time, and stuff will come up. Okay. <laughs> Now, I was new to academia. I'm a first generation academic. I'm a well trained ethnographer. So, even though the bulk of the faculty was so disaffected, we actually had a strike my first year uh, uh, on the faculty. Um, they were so disaffected, they didn't go to faculty meetings. I went to faculty meetings because I need to learn the situation. Be there. Just being there is important. And because I went to faculty meeting, now here was a college of liberal arts, we had about 300 faculty, 30 showed up for faculty meeting. And I'm the only visible brown person in the room. But guess what? I ended up on the faculty council because the deans got to a point who went to the faculty council. And that way you learn. Uh, I, I learned, I won't go into all of the details of the things that I learned, but let me just say that I, with good reason, bragged that I single-handedly saved TIAA CREF from being dismantled while I was on the faculty. You don't send the head of personnel to lecture the faculty council and have the first sentence of his speech say, your retirement plan pays you too much money. <laughs> to a working class kid who was like, really? My thesis advisor was right when she said, don't go to a place that doesn't have TIA crap? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh no, we're not going there. And be willing, this is the other thing that's hard. Um, because there was so much terror and fear, I'm, I'm, I'm an activist. I, I, came, I came to sociology as an activist. And my father had said to me, he said, no matter what happens, you can still work with your two hands. He, he, he's like, uh, you know, you don't sell your soul for anything, including tenure. And so, I, you know, I, I was ready to go to war. I, I, I said good morning to the president every day when I was on my picket line station in front of the School of Theology with my great big sign that said, there is some nonsense we will not tolerate which was a translation of a sign from the anti-war movement that didn't say nonsense. But, <laughs> but when you're in front of the School of Theology, you have to. And he would say good morning, and I would say good morning. You know, treating him like another human being, even though he was a little bit of a terrorist, um, it was you know, just what was necessary. But then you find yourself in the place. But it became a training ground. So that when I went to this small liberal arts college, where the entire faculty was one third of just the liberal arts faculty, you know, I was like, you know, if, if my classes count for all these things in different departments, do I get a vote in each department? And they had to explain to you, no, you can't get, you know, I went to take over the place, you know, I was ready. But I was able and ready to speak up and know when know the institution well enough to say, okay, you may not be able to do this, but you can do this. And that's that, but, but you've got to do the field work. You've got to sit there and know what it is and be prepared to make the arguments. But just simply being present, going to meetings. As one people, I used to joke that I didn't stay at the U because of course I wanted to teach African American women social change, I was gonna have to wait till somebody died in order to teach it, because there was already somebody there who was tenured, who was doing, and I joke about it, but I got to host her at Colby when we gave her an honorary degree when she was in her 90s. So, <laughs> you know, she and I ended up friends, so. But, but you go there, you get skills in one space, and you may not stay there, but those skills enable you in another space, and learning institutional networks, learning the hookup, Irving Goffman's book, A Silence, I cannot recommend it more highly. And there is 
one chapter in there called The Underlife of the Total Institution. And it is a wonderful little missive to tell you how to function in any kind of organization, how people see things. And he's, he's from that tradition in sociology. We call it symbolic interaction, but it's the closest we have to um, anthropology. But you know, how do we, and when and under what circumstances, being in ministry, you're going to have people come to you who are going to be like Nicodemus coming by night. Um, who are expecting you. So remember who you represent in those spaces. Um, and you'd be surprised. I, I used to find myself having to explain to people, you know, look, um, if, I'm, if I'm clergy here at the college, then I'm under the authority of the dean of students. I am not clergy here at the college. There's certain things I cannot do. You know, knowing when I have to stay in my lane. But also knowing that we have a witness that we carry with us once, as my father told me when I was answering my call to ministry, once you say you're doing that, be prepared, be prepared, be prepared. So that's the best I can, without knowing the specifics, that's the best I can do. But pay attention, go to meetings. I know people may get on your last nerve, and one of the nice things about being Baptist is you can sit in meetings for a long time. <laughs> you know, you are hardwired to do field work. We have time for one last question. Okay. And you kind of sort of answered many of the questions that were written when they were asking about diversity and ethnography. Mm -hmm. So the summative question is, I attend a church where women are not allowed to speak in front of the church or preach. What would you say to elders at this church about what they are missing and not hearing from women in the pulpit? We only have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Obviously, I um, was not at and would not be at that in, in that situation. So, but I also know that people are in churches because of love, a sense of calling. I, and I don't know the denominational body. This is the other thing. Um, Really? Yeah. Whoa, boy. Okay. I don't know if you've ever read anything by or about Susan Brooks Thistlethwaite, but when she was, I think, at Duke, she used to get sent out to preach, supply preach. She's the United Church of Christ. And she's no, well, I meant to say the, the, the church of the ICOC, the International Church of Christ. Oh, you're not talking about UCC. No, no, no. I have a new book. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's a denominational body that has. Non-denominational. Well, they have an association of churches that are networked? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're non-denominational. But I explained to students when we're doing sociology of religion, you know, who are the networks of churches? And I said, your church is non-denominational? Ask who ordained your pastor. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we get the data? Um. Not knowing, okay, okay. So I, I know it's not UCC. So okay, because I was gonna say. Is that from the Campbellite movement? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's it's from that um fr from that tradition. Okay. Do they still only have no instrumental music? No, we have instrumental, but I guess it depends on the Yeah, it depends. Okay. Um, not knowing why. I know if it were me. Biblical. Huh? Biblical? It ain't. But, um. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. But, but the thing is, the, the thing is that we, I had to learn it ain't. Because, um, huh? Yeah. Yeah, but the, the, then he sends Phoebe. And the Greek text underneath is the same word for Phoebe as it is for Stephen. And you don't realize until until I had I preached from that text. When I was little, my parents were getting ready to have my second little brother. They would sit down at the table and they were talking about what names they were going to choose. So if he was a boy, he was going to be Frederick J. But if he was a girl, he was going to be Phoebe. And I remember I was like eight years old. I'm like, Phoebe, how do you spell it? 
I was like horrified that they were gonna give her my little sister named Phoebe. My P H O E B E. Mommy, you can't give her. I every night when I lay down got down on my knees to pray, I prayed that the next baby would be a boy. <laughs> so Frederick J arrived and Phoebe was not my little sister. But then I had to preach on Phoebe. Phoebe. Yeah. Ken Creai is East Corinth. Why does Paul send this deacon from East Corinth to Rome to take care of stuff till he gets there? And it is, and this is where it, it's a matter of having a company of women in the church who are in leadership who want to break this yoke. Then it, you may need to have workshops that the pastor comes and sits and listens to. Um, I did a workshop one time for a church in Harrisburg. And I have this quiz that I use to get to talk about biblical women. Because unless you bring them to the foreground, and you know, you have to teach congregations that when we're dealing with the Bible, we're dealing with an androcentric document. And I can explain androcentric for anybody. Trust me, I know how to do this. And then I use the examples in, in the fact that it's androcentric is that Shifra and Pua got away with telling the, with, um, telling the Pharaoh that the babies come too fast. You know, Pharaoh didn't know nothing about birth and no baby. And then of the 613 rules that they come up with in the Torah, there are no regulations for midwives and childbirth. The only thing is, you know, how long you're unclean until, you know, it's it. Said. Other than that, we don't know a thing about what's going on when the room, in the room where it's happening, okay? And uh, until you read a novel like The Red Tent, right. mm -hmm. and you know, somehow D Dina gets lost in the process of talking about Jacob's children and all, all of this stuff. So it's like getting making women visible, bringing them to the front, and showing, and basically getting people to understand that when you see a woman named or unnamed in the Bible, because it is an androcentric document, sirens must go off and lights must flash and bells must ring because she's really important. You know, uh, you know, these are basically men writing. Did anybody see that Jeopardy episode where the answer was Hebrews? Paul's left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were so wrong. Okay. <laughs> and they got a whole lot of pushback on that. Yeah. Uh, and they said, well, we use the King James. I have King James versions that do not say a letter to Paul, a, a letter, an epistle of Paul. So even if you're using King James as your standard, so every contestant knows that the King James Bible is the standard for answering the question, depending on which King, King James, and Amy Schneider happened to have the right King James in her head and got the answer right. But um, I would have answered, I think, I think I would have answered Romans. And, um, because of Paul, the Pauline connection. Um, so, but there are theories. We don't know who wrote Hebrews, and there are theories that it may have been written by a woman, even with the androcentric language. So, getting so having workshops. I did this workshop where, we did, and I remember these ministers who were there sitting in the back of the room. They took copies of the quiz with them. Don't think you want to own everything. Be sure you want to give it away because that's, a, that's what, it's missionary work. It's missionary work. The struggle is pulpit by pulpit, association by association. And uh, when you get a chance to speak, lift it up. I remember when I had to speak, remember my, um, my um, head of the denominational body that was um, daughter, if you sit down before 45 minutes. Well, I had to preach, no, I had to speak for, um, I forget what the event was. And I railed on Baptist polity, and I said, when Baptist churches try to tell other Baptist churches who they should or should not ordain, I call it ecclesiological fascism. That was 40 years ago. They're still saying ecclesiological fascism. 
And my association, uh, not only do they ordain women, we've got women pastors, and we've got somebody online to become president. Um, so so it, it, it is a struggle. And like I said, I don't know every reason. I know if, I, I know what I would do, but I'm in a, I'm, I've been in a beneficial situation all of my life with this church. And so um, I got to see women in the pulpit when I didn't know they were discriminated against. Because a man by the name of Herbert O. Edwards at one point was the pastor of our church while he was working on his degrees and, at Harvard. And he told the women of the church that for Women's Day, they had to have a, a, an ordained woman or a licensed evangelist for the morning service. They could have any other speakers they want because lots of times with Women's Day, they'll invite you know elected officials, the local doctor, but they won't let a, an ordained woman in the pulpit. So this is the other, you know, the craziness of how creatively human beings can discriminate is amazing. And you know, assigning it to human creativity is difficult, but unfortunately, as um, Octavia Butler has pointed out, the two characteristics of being human that get us in trouble is we're extremely intelligent and we're very hierarchical. And those, that, that combination can sometimes be lethal. You know, we're dealing with what, an Iron Age world with all of the problems that we have now. How do we translate that world to what we do? But when it comes to the issue of women, um, there's a lot of teaching to be done. Now, I know if I had been at that church and then it became the rule, say a pastor came in, you know, because I just, a number of years ago, we had a pastor that, it, it wasn't a woman thing, but he didn't read the room. Um, and I remember I came home from church one Sunday and I exploded in front of my father, the deacon, and he goes, daughter, what you gonna do? Because once, once you're in the pulpit, there's a chain of command in the pulpit, and I either had to leave or shut up. I shut up. At one point, I had to write a four-page, single-space pastoral letter to the congregation to keep them from changing the Constitution so they could more easily fire him. That's how bad things got. And then I found out later they were all angry with me because I wasn't fighting with them. But I couldn't, you know. This, but. You know, if, if it was some place where I felt I had to leave, I would leave with a big public letter explaining why I'm going and explaining why you're wrong. People have been leaving. Huh? They've been leaving. But, yeah. but not, but but quietly and not, and um, and, and it, you need you need to know that there's something wrong. Um, can I just tell one other little tiny? No. <laughs> she bishop. She in charge. <laughs> no, no, one please, please let me let's thank Dr. Jesus and Dr. Jennifer. I know people have to go to the class tomorrow at eleven o'clock. Right? For the festival of preaching and the and the faculty panel and then Thursday morning. Okay. But you can come up and ask her a question and we have to be out of here at five by before four thirty. Okay. So we have another place to be. Okay. All okay. right. So okay. please let me thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you. Bless you.